guys. Jake here again from Hot Gun Spokes. This is the second installment of Tech Tuesday, um, our once weekly feature on um, important parts of mountain bike mechanics that in many cases are overlooked or not known uh, or just represent best practices um, that any experienced rider who cares about their bicycle um, should be keeping up on and reminding themselves of Despite my experience level as a mechanic, uh, I am constantly learning new things and I recommend that everybody does that because nobody knows everything um, and if a bike mechanic ever tells you that they do, just run. Just get out of there, get a taco and never go back in. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about having learned in episode one how to buy a good suspension fork um, and ensure accurate PSI readings. We're now going to talk about how to do the more important part, which is set up your fork for correct sag and I'll also give just a basic tutorial on um, the essential features of a fork, how to adjust um, your, your air spring, um, how to adjust your damper settings, uh, and then crucially sag, which is the, uh, the starting uh, amount of squish in your fork or your rear shock, when we're talking full suspension, um, that allows you to, to hit the ground running um, on suspension duties. And it's important to remember that uh, as a starting point, suspension is often thought of um, probably by the you know kids you see bombing in dickies and dirt jump parks everywhere. It's thought of as a, as a jump feature. That is not accurate. Um, suspension certainly covers jump duties and you would be silly to be doing G outs without a, a suspension. Um, but as a physics proposition and as a racing proposition, the suspension is first and foremost designed to make you faster because by essentially keeping you level um, as you ride over choppy terrain, you're riding more efficiently. So first and foremost, the suspension, when it's engineered by companies like RockShox and Fox and, and DBO and some other uh, great examples out there, it's made as a, as a speed and efficiency tool um, that also covers jump duties and smooths out the ride. That's relevant because uh, if you want to take what I'm about to show you to uh, an extreme, it will make you a faster competitor, um, but it'll also just make anybody uh, a faster rider who doesn't, who doesn't like to go fast under control. So um, before I talk about things like damper settings or um, some of the air spring adjustments you can do, SAG is the best place to start. Um, that is, as I said, uh, the starting squish of your fork or your rear shock. And it's largely determined by uh, your weight, your height, your basic riding style, uh, and a couple of other variables. There are two ways you can go about setting SAG. Um, RockShox has a great app, and I should mention that I'm not paid to endorse RockShox. Um, that wouldn't wouldn't hurt down the road, but I'm, I'm just a fan and an expert on their forks. Um, we specialize at Hogtown Spokes as well as making bike protective gear. We do expert local tuning of mountain bikes in Toronto, uh, and RockShox is my specialty. So they, they do have a great app um, that is uh, facilitated by RockShox SRAM, their parent company, and it allows you to take the serial number from your your fork, which is on the back of the CSU, that's the crown steer upper assembly. It's the top part of the fork with the stanchions. You'll find that serial number and you can plug it in on their website um, and it essentially gives you access to the app features. So from there, you'll, you'll plug in your fork model, um, you'll plug in your weight, your riding style, and the app will churn out some pretty good starting recommendations for SAG, uh, for rebound settings for damper clicks. If you don't know anything about suspension or you just find it needlessly complex and you just want to ride, highly recommend using the RockShox app. It's a good place to begin. This is Trailhead. This is the RockShox app I was raving about. You can see the address up here, https double backslash trailhead.rockshox.com. If George walks across my computer, he likes to do that. Don't worry. Got a nice graphic here. Do you even shred, bro? You can see these guys being like, yo, dude, 
I live for the Nah, the Lulus in the Pacific weather. Let's go into Burnaby tonight. Sorry. I love you guys, PC. Um, oh, uh, just while I'm on the humorous topic, if I was from Australia, my name would be the Chunda from Down Under. Also love the Aussies, best athletes in the world. Sam Hill, you're a rock star. All right, so enough farting around. Let's get in here. Useful to have your serial number handy. Um, unless your dad wore Coke bottle glasses and worked for NASA in the 60s. In other words, you're a massive geek, even more than I am. Probably not going to have this remembered offhand. Okay, perfect. So as I said, based on the serial number, it'll pull up all of the key identifying markers. Haley's Fork is a RockShox Reba 2018 RL, Boost, Solo Air, 140. All righty. So actually, this is really cool. Got all the stuff we need here. Tuning, documents, service kits, upgrade kits. I'm going to click on tuning. And here we can go ahead and make the fun stuff happen. So my weight, including riding gear, I said it was 170 before riding gear. Mm. If I'm being the pack mule, let's say I'm 185 on a rough day. Especially if my mother-in-law has fed me a hearty breakfast. Bless her soul. It's MTV. Perfect. Sort of. That's that's a. Th those numbers are a little high, uh, but as a starting point, I maintain this is a good app. Um, I, I would almost never set a fork in 118 psi, even with that much gear. But the rebound, uh, which is saying I should be 11 clicks from fully closed, that's that's a good recommendation, and I'll explain later um, that I tend to give that a fair bit of credence, but. Odds are I'll have to back this off a little bit, but um, I will say that you're better to have an app over-recommend PSI than under-recommend PSI. Um, you don't want a, a meek app. So there is some teeth to this guy. And if you're, again, if you're just not sure how to set fork up um, or you're just more on the set it and forget it, I want to get out there and ride end of the spectrum, come here. Come to Trailhead. Use the RockShex app. It is a good place to begin. So we've just used the useful RockShox app um, and we've seen our, our starting recommendation. I have no issue with people going out and using that. I think it is a good tool and kudos to RockShox for leading the way in doing something like that. Um, but ultimately with, with uh, high level mechanics, there's no substitute for a human. And I'm not just saying that because this is my livelihood. I fundamentally believe that. Um, my previous career, if you will, prior to bike mechanics, I was a, a master level technician and fitter in the golf industry, which is infinitely more complex when it comes to setting things up. I know that sounds crazy, but um, in golf, we actually apply rocket science and uh, high speed cameras with integrated Doppler radar to fit somebody for equipment. So it's, it is um, asinine and just riddled with minutia, but that's the way the sport is now. Um, but in golf, you know, there's a systematic fitting methodology that you can rely on to fit yourself, but ultimately there's no substitute for that, that tour experience where a technician is um, essentially surpassing the software with anecdotes, personal insight, and most importantly, facts that are tailored to the specific golfer, or in the case of bikes, rider who will be using the equipment. So I, I like to, whenever possible, um, kind of ignore those settings a little bit and, and just give somebody um, a, a starting point that's based on my interview of their riding style coupled with our, our hard facts like like weight and, and height and uh, the fork itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and show you how to set SAG, um, but the first place to begin with that is to show the gradient scale that comes on all RockShox forks. Um, it is their precisely for this purpose. You can see that on these beautiful fast black stanchions, uh, there's a laser etched scale. It'll have 
multiple numbers. So on the front side, we see 120 mils of travel, 130 mils of travel. And on the back side, we're going to see 140 and 150 mils, respectively. The reason you get all those measurements is just because it would be too expensive for rock shocks to only print one scale. Um, and it also allows you to change the travel on your fork and keep using the same stanchions. Uh, all this fork needs to be 120 or 150 is a new uh, air spring assembly, which is, for a professional mechanic like myself, pretty easy to facilitate. So um, it's not just cost savings, actually. It's, it's about uh, doing the customer a favor. But it's really cool. Um, nobody else offers this. You will not find this on a Fox fork. And this scale is accurate to the millimeter. Uh, it is it is to scale, in other words, and it's designed so that depending on how far up this red O-ring goes, you get a gauge of what your sag is. Um, so let's say I was at uh, the 120 mil travel setting. My stanchions would look a little smaller, and I was aiming for 20% sag or 30% sag. After inflating the fork and sitting on the seat and assuming a riding position, that O-ring should reach 20 or 30% depending on what I'm looking at. And that will tell me that I am naturally sagging or depressing the fork at 20 to 30% of its total usable travel. And you're doing that because you want to make sure that the fork um, essentially hits the ground running and has some, some legs in the fight uh, prior to you even hitting you know, proper high speed compression trail obstacles. Um, otherwise it would be like riding on a rigid fork which completely defeats the purpose in terms of speed and efficiency and then also being set up for jumps. So in my case, um, I'll use myself as an example to set the sag. I weigh roughly 170 pounds before riding gear, and I ride aggressively. Um, it's a hardtail bike, so I need my front suspension, my only suspension, to do double duty. Uh, and I just know from past experience that my sort of go-to number tends to be as high as 85 to 90 PSI. So I'm going to go ahead and inflate the fork uh, to that number. And I'll sit on the bike in the attack position, and ideally the O-ring will indicate that my sag is between 20 and 25 percent, which in my experience, given those variables I just mentioned about my riding style, um, my intuition of the fork, my weight, is a really, really good starting number. If I was to go 25 or 30, which some people will do on a fork, I'd get a very plush ride but I would burn through that travel a little faster than I'd like. And more than that, um, as soon as I get out and I start climbing out of the saddle or just aggressively uh, pedaling, it's going to get a little bit bobby. I'd like a little bit more stiffness. Um, so, you know, in a rear shock, 25 or 30 on some bikes, depending on the, the kinematics, that's not bad. Uh, that's advisable in many cases. But on a fork, uh, most experienced riders with uh, uh, who, are, who are males with a, at least an average body type uh, will probably want to go a little closer to 20%. The keener among you will notice that this does not look like a standard air spring top cap. You would be correct. On this fork, uh, Haley has an MRP ramp control cartridge installed, which is why you see MRP here, and you've got that distinctive orange top cap and dial. That is, um, it's almost like adding a damper to your air spring assembly. I'll get to that later, but in terms of inflating the fork, once you take this cap off, it's the same as any other conventional top cap. So we're gonna take our trusty shock pump here, I'm going to carefully thread on the lower knurled nut with the O-rings. As I mentioned last week, a good shock pump like this will have a separate engagement knurled nut so that you don't um, end up leaking air when you remove it. 
Okay, so that's securely in place. I'll then go ahead and engage the upper knurled nut. And that is what the air pressure is currently at. Haley is maybe 130 pounds with riding gear. Um, so she's appropriately at roughly 70 PSI right now. Um, she could probably go a little bit lighter, but for what we were doing recently, that makes sense. As I said, I need to be closer to 85-90, so I'm going to go ahead and add some pressure here. Just bleed that off just a little bit with this re release valve. Okay. So we're at, I would say, 87, 88 PSI. I'll go ahead and first unscrew the upper knurled nut so that when I then disengage the main one with the O-rings, there's no air loss. Okay. As I would with my factory rock shocks, or Haley Wood, I should say, with her factory rock shocks top cap. Make sure we install it again. When you're setting sag, it's really important to double check. That the compression, so the damper dial is not locked out at all. You want to have that fully open and you want to make sure that your o-ring on the right damper leg is at the bottom there. You're then going to sit on the seat if you can because your bike is supported you can put both feet on the pedals. Um, I don't recommend bouncing and rocking but you know you should you should put your weight on the seat like you want to be in an aggressive attack leg position here. Stand up, as you can see, the O-ring jumps a little bit. And that indicates, because we're looking at our back scale, that I'm right where I want to be. I am just below 20% sag. 10, 20, 30 for 140 mils of travel, which is what her fork is. And that, in my past experience, is a great place to begin. It'll give me some suppleness on that initial chatter, um, but I'm not going to feel like I'm wallowing. And then that fork is really well set up for me to activate the rest of this travel once I start to actually get into the NAR. So we set our sag. That's the first place to begin. Our damper dial is fully open. Our MRP cartridge, which I'll explain, is also fully open. And now I can start to focus on those aspects of setting up my fork to ride. So we'll go ahead and adjust our damper, which is this blue uh, dial on the right stanchion. All motion control dampers, so that's the uh, sort of the entry level damper on a uh, RockShox Solo Air fork. They'll all look like this. This this damper basically controls through an elaborate shim stack um, inside the stanchion, and then the movement of oil through that shim stack. It controls how quickly and how far this stanchion can activate and then rebound does that in conjunction with the rebound setting, but that's basically a good description of what the damper does. It controls how far down I can get this to go, especially under pedaling inputs, um, and then ultimately when I go ahead and really, really gnar the bike hard, um, it'll also relate to the, the high speed compression, which is um, when you make a big hit or you really stomp something out on the trail, how far do you get through that travel? 
should point something out really, really critical um, on, certainly on any motion control damper, don't ever fully lock the fork out if you're going downhill or if there's a chance you will be going downhill. Um, technically this fork does not do a full lockout. So just estimating motion control on the farthest right locked out setting probably will shut the fork off 95%, but that's, that's still a bit dicey. You know, a fork that's almost rigid, um, taking hits and, and hard trail inputs, that is not good for the internals. So just make sure that if you are flicking that switch to lock it out uh, during a climb or a ride to the trail, you always make sure you do your due diligence and at least have it a click or two open before you start going downhill. For aggressive riding, I don't like to really have any lockout on this. Uh, there's only, in actuality, five or six, um, sometimes four, depending on your damper, useful settings on this guy. Um, so you're not really missing much if you don't adjust it anyway, but even if this was a charger equipped fork, uh, which is RockShox's high-end damper that's on the some of the revelations and certainly on the pikes and the lyrics and of course on uh, on almost every boxer you you would want to go ahead and uh, and play around with that a little bit because there's more settings but on motion control my experience with riders is that it's better to just leave it fully open and control the stiffness feel of the bike uh, under pedaling inputs as well as proper trail inputs using something like a ramp control cartridge or frankly just the initial sag setting um, this this thing Haley, who knows uh, knows the basics about her fork she'll pretty much only activate for for climbs uh, or riding to the trail or occasionally if it is a little bit choppy and she just wants um, you know, a stiffer feel coming off some of these obstacles. Maybe she'll give it a click or two, but she's aware that leaving that fork fully open uh, will make it the most sensitive and it'll make it easier for her to go ahead and use all of that available travel. George Brick. I just explained how the damper control works uh, and how on motion control forks I tend to just leave them open, and I've advised Haley to do that. She's had lots of success doing that. And it's really just because um, you want your fork to be lively, uh, if also set for the correct stiffness, which you'll do through sag, but also because motion control dampers are pretty basic, and with only a handful of usable settings, um, doesn't really do anything to go ahead and adjust those. Uh, you're better served by just keeping it open. So for that reason, on solo air forks like the Reba here, this is a 2018 RockShox Reba, I actually ironically will advise people to do most of their, what would normally be damper adjustments on a higher end fork using this addition to the air spring assembly, this MRP ramp control cartridge. I'm not sure whether MRP would want me des describing it this way, but uh, if anything, I'm complimenting the unit, and I'll just tell it like it is. This is this is effectively a second damper. Uh, this little canister it it looks like a uh, almost like a a military uh, armament capsule. It's about this long, and what it's designed to do is substitute, at least in the first version, if not the newest one that's about to come out, but in this original version. Um, it's a substitute for the volume spacers, which RockShox calls bottomless tokens, that you would normally put in the air spring or left side of the fork to control ultimate high speed bottom out resistance. What that means is, think of the air chamber here as a, uh, we'll say roughly 10 inch long hollow shaft that is air sealed uh, except for hydraulic fluid being in the bottom portion and then there's some some grease on the top here uh, which seals the top cap so essentially it's just air in there and if you 
Um, just think of that error as a finite variable. It'll always be an amount of resistance that causes that proportional to the rider that causes that travel to fully activate. It's dictated by the size of that hollow chamber. So we'll say it's X right now, based on that roughly 10 inch unadulterated length. And if this fork was too soft for me, um, I could find myself burning through all of that travel and sending this crown basically all the way down to the wiper seals and bottoming out. How do I deal with that? Historically, I deal with that with volume spacers, which shrink that 10 inch tube. The spacers might take it from 10 inches to six or seven or eight. By making that area smaller, the internal pressure will increase, therefore making it more resistant to bottoming out, even in the same fork. So they're, they're really neat. They screw in underneath the air cap. They're high quality. You can install them by hand. RockShox and Fox have done a terrific job with those guys. But the knock on volume spacers is that they can produce a harsh feel, especially off the top, um, while you're still waiting to activate that travel because they're essentially just blunt instruments. Um, they just kind of sit there and they're just really there for the, uh, the ultimate high speed compression battle. MRP, which is a Colorado based company that makes terrific um, bash guards and uh, now they make forks and they make actually a bunch of items. Uh, a couple years ago, they decided that they would, a few years ago I should say, they decided they would uh, try and modernize the volume spacer and really bring it into the 21st century and give it not only the historical bottom out resistance, but some extra features as well, principally tunability on the fly with just the twist of the dial, uh, as well as, in effect, a little bit of suppleness to go with that bottom out resistance. And it's because of the tunability and the suppleness that I like to refer to this as a second damper, even though it's on the air spur. With traditional bottomless tokens, let's say I have three in there and I've overcompensated for how easy it is to crash through that travel. And I put three tokens in a 140 mil fork. That's going to feel pretty pretty harsh, um, and if I can even get the travel to go all the way through, it's going to feel like I'm landing on a uh, an old maple cottage. Not a great sensation when you're riding trails. Let's say though I back it off to two, that may not be enough, uh, and then I could still be left with the issue though that the fork feels a little bit wooden at the start. So what MRP has done through this brilliant little ramp control capsule um, is they've given you the ability to tune the bottom of resistance to tune this volume spacing on the fly. And I'm here rotating from maximum bottom of resistance, also known as maximum progressivity in the fork, to minimal bottom of resistance or minimal progressivity. Um, it would be nice if this was an index dial that ratcheted. It doesn't. It's based on a almost a friction feel. You'll feel the, the resistance at maximum progressive and minimum progressive. But nevertheless, it's, it still works and maybe they'll add an index at some point. But so we've, you know, we've set our sag, we've adjusted uh, or frankly not adjusted our traditional damper. And this is where We'll start to really fine tune and tailor this fork with the ramp control cartridge. Haley, as I mentioned earlier, is 130 pounds roughly with riding gear uh, and she's still new to the sport so she's not you know out there bombing stuff um, but even she has crept through that travel once or twice so she'll always give her cartridge a couple of clicks um, and generally where she's at now is She'll get that MRP logo parallel to her fork, which is about halfway through its usable adjustment. MRP, uh, if I'm not mistaken, will quote that if you go all the way towards full progression 
it's equivalent to having four bottom spacer bottom uh, excuse me bottomless tokens or volume spacers in there um, which normally would be a really harsh feel and then the catch with MRP is you you don't get that harsh feel I, I would agree with that I think that that is is what it ends up doing uh, and more importantly I think that's how it ends up feeling but Haley Haley is not at that yet so she's she's doing the equivalent of two traditional bottomless tokens um, but without without the wooden sensation because this thing is just a little more tunable and, and a little more sensitive than than those tokens um, and you know I can only make a case so much for something that doesn't have hydraulic fluid in there it doesn't uh, offer the the plush tunability effects that a proper damper does because there's no oil in there but the way it acts like a damper and the way it still acts way, way it still offers that subtleness is the fact that Haley can can tweak it on the go. So if she wants that supple feel, it's as simple as leaning down while she rides or while she's trail side and just backing off the progression. And then perhaps when she's heading into a jump, she goes ahead and extreme cases cranks that progression even further. And that's where in effect, this functions as a damper because it'll give you the ability to principally resist bottoming out, but also give a bit of um, plushness through the adjustment of the dial when when wanted. So it's, it's essentially a tool-free, um, modular version of the volume spacer. And a final tip is if this ever feels um, like it's not allowing you to use full travel or if your fork feels super squishy after you've just inflated it and you're not sure why that is. It could just be that there's a little bit uh, of an air, essentially an air um, stiction in the cartridge. There's just some air trapped there. MRP recommends that when you install this, this guy afresh and probably from time to time, you just give your fork a good thorough cycle, um, which means when the cartridge is out and you're installing it, so you pull your CSU all the way up, you get every last bit of air out of the upper positive chamber. Uh, and then once it's installed, you go ahead and pump your fork a bunch of times. And that'll just make sure that it's, it's nice and empty, um, it's feeling proper, and it's ready to go ahead and complement your motion control damper as an effective second damper. I am a huge fan of this product. Uh, and I would love to try the, the second generation um, that apparently allows you to use traditional volume spacers uh, from MRP, but, but with this unit. So look for a future review of that item. Okay, so we've done um, SAG, we've adjusted the uh, damper, which is the right side of the fork, the traditional adjustment dial. We've also talked about what is effectively a second damper in MRP's fantastic ramp control cartridge. The fourth and final aspect of setting up a bike for trail riding or beyond is remap, which is this dial um, on the bottom right part of the fork. It is opposite to the top right damper adjustment dial, and it is uh, the second part of, a, uh, of the two-part um, constitution of a damper system. What rebound does is it effectively controls how fast the fork recovers. Um, and by doing that, it, it effectively contributes to how much compression the damper is allowing you to have. Because if this doesn't rebound very quickly, um, when you're out there dynamically using and actually riding trails, your, your travel is effectively reduced. Conversely, if your rebound is too fast, um, you've almost, you can almost think of it as having too much travel uh, with further bad consequences and that the fork is gonna recover so quickly that uh, you won't be ready for it. And, and that's, a, that's a, um, 
phenomenon that people will often refer to as, as the fork bucking or them being bucked off the bike. Um, you don't want your rebound to be too fast, but for most people there's a sweet spot there that allows the fork to perform optimally. Um, on RockShox forks, when you rotate to your right, if I was standing behind the stanchion to your right, that'll slow down the rebound. And if you rotate to your left, that'll speed it up. And that is controlling how fast this hydraulic oil will open up um, and, and basically facilitate a clear pathway in the shim stack, allowing these stanchions to recover based on the air pressure. Um, as much as there is a happy medium, being honest, I would say that advanced riders tend to favor a fast rebound. And that's just because um, as much as being bucked off the bike is a phenomenon, a more serious phenomenon is what's called stacking. Um, stacking is when your rebound is so slow that it doesn't recover fast enough for the next trail input. So let's say I'm riding single track and there's a series of drop-offs. First one is two feet and my fork goes through a third of the travel. But it doesn't fully recover because the rebound is too slow. By the time I hit that second drop-off, which might be three or four feet, that fork that started at 140 millimeters may actually only offer 130 or 135. And then from there, I hit the third drop off, which could be five or six feet. I'm gonna burn through even more travel, probably bottom of the fork, which in a properly set up fork, it's still okay to do at least once a ride, but let's say I bottom that out, but my rebound is too slow. If there's a fourth trail input, that travel that hasn't recovered may hit the fourth input at not 130 or 135. It could be as low as like 100 or 110. And if you're on some really stretched out, gnarly section, by the time you finish your ride, you could effectively be on a rigid fork because it'll just be a diminishing return situation. That's what stacking is. You're overloading your fork because you have set the rebound too slow. You do not want that. And that's why a lot of elite riders within that happy medium tend to favor a little bit faster rebound. What I would suggest for rebound is this is where you want to privilege the RockShox app a little bit more. The stuff like SAG, um, I'm, I'm certainly more flexible as you've seen, but you know, rebound settings on the app are pretty good. Um, where you can then condition that is just to provide yourself with um, some, some personalized input based on your riding style. So if where you ride, there is a lot of that fast, successive NAR, you want to go ahead and, and set that rebound a little quicker. So if the app is recommended, say eight clicks from fully, fully closed, the, the slowest setting, maybe you just do four or three. On the other hand, if where you ride is uh, mellower, it's a little bit more of a cross country trail, and that, uh, that big high speed compression hit is at the end, and then you've got a nice recovery after, and your biggest priority is just a smooth plush ride that's a little bit easier on your body, that's where you can be a little slower. Because even if your fork does um, take a little bit longer to recover, by the time you get to that next obstacle, if there is one, it'll have recovered. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's again where there's no substitute for the personal experience because you need to, uh, you need to be fitting yourself dynamically based on how you ride, um, as useful as the app is, not, not based on an algorithm or just what some guy says on the internet. Uh, I don't mean myself, I mean comments on bike forms. So we've talked about rebound in reverse order, we've talked about MRP cartridge, we've talked about our damper, we've talked about SAG. Fork is now fully set up and ready to ride. And then to relate back to what I was saying about my experience in the golf industry, uh, Ping, which is a superb company, they're an ISO company, they basically invented custom fitting in the golf industry. 
they have a five-step fitting process. The fifth step is dynamic on-course monitoring. So that's, you've been fitted by a professional, you've done all of your due diligence, you've ticked off these boxes, but then you actually go out and play, you prove it in the dirt, and you see what um, your playing style dictates for post hoc adjustments to that fit. It's the same thing in bicycles. You want to go out and experiment, you want to ride the same trail several times, you want to ride different trails several times, and then based on the knowledge you now have, you can make these adjustment tweaks, or if the fork is perfect, you make those tweaks down the road when your body type or your uh, riding style changes. The final part of our video, again, not a shameless plug, but just an experienced mechanic talking about what works, um, is just to mention a, a quick service thing for ensuring that your fork stays smooth. This will shock a lot of people, and I'm not defending that it's somehow convenient. It's not. You're spending a fortune on a fork. It would be nice if they were like vehicles and they lasted longer in tip-top shape, but the reality is you want to follow your service manual and you want to follow the expertise of RockShox and Fox and DDO and so forth, engineers who do this full time and live and breathe this stuff. And RockShox recommends with every single air fork that you do a 50 hour lower service and then you do a 200 hour full fork service. So with a lower service, I will take somebody's um, lowers off of the stanchions, the fork will be scoured, it'll get fresh oil, it'll be thoroughly clean, and it'll be appropriately greased. And what that means is not just grabbing the bike grease you'll use, regardless of what the quality is, but it's using the proper grease on your wiper seals, uh, which effectively lubricate your stanchions. For RockShox forks, SRAM butter is your best bet. It is not cheap, uh, and I don't recommend handling it without gloves, but it is incredibly effective. I have seen forks as a technician come in that were clean and you know pleasant to ride, but the owner will say to me, well, you know, why is why is the travel gauge off? Why does the fork say it does 140, but I'm not even putting pressure on the bike and the gauge looks like it's 130. Usually the reason for that is the fork needs a lower service and there is stiction at the wiper seals because they're dried out. That is when your fork needs the lower service properly done by a professional and it needs the correct lubrication. Um, SRAM butter is as close as you will get to a pure grade grease. And it is, hey Georgie, it is extremely effective at restoring that, that full travel, um, that slippery, confidence-inspiring squish that you want from a good air fork. So when you buy this stuff, um, it's an expensive industry, but spend a couple dollars more, buy the good grease, or make sure you're using a professional mechanic who will service a RockShox fork with SRAM butter. So that concludes episode two of Tech Tuesday. Um, as always, please like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, and if you have any comments or questions, feel free to do so. You can also shoot us an email at info.hogtownspokes at gmail.com, and our website is hogtownspokes.com. We offer the most personalized and specialized mountain bike service in the city of Toronto. Thanks guys.